um, I think we are probably at most of the people that'll join. Okay, cool. Well, we can get going. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I think we have you for about an hour. Um, so we're going to keep uh, this initial part, which some of you will be familiar with, um, sort of short and sweet, but if you have questions, absolutely, we can circle back on them. We wanted to try and make sure we have as much time for you all as we can, walking you through the actual online viewer and then maybe any questions you guys might have uh, for that. I will say at the outset, um, if you've got a bunch of specific questions about certain roads or corridors or, or, or SE data in your community, um, it's probably better to follow up with us and we can have a specific conversation about that um, rather than use this hour or so of time um, and end up focusing in on, on one, one road or, or, or just one, you know, community, if that makes sense to everybody. So it's not that we don't want to talk to you about it. We just don't want to talk to you about it right now, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but other than that, welcome. Um, we're going to talk to you about the 2050 MTP's preliminary deficiency analysis results and the viewer that you all um, can use to explore that data. It's an online viewer. Um, the first part of this is just reminding everyone what the deficiency analysis is. Then we'll kind of give you an orientation of that online viewer and talk to you a bit about some suggested approaches to review the data um, to hopefully help you be successful at understanding what it's telling you and making sure that, in particular, um, some of the underlying assumptions are, are, are correct, because this viewer will be very, very similar to the, same, to the viewer that we'll ask you to use when we get into the next step of our MTP process, the alternatives analysis. And then we'll also talk a little about who to contact if you have questions or comments or need assistance. Um, Alex, you can go ahead and advance there, please. So, uh, as a reminder, we're sort of at the, the second of the four big boxes of our MTP uh, update process. Um, and that really involves a lot of the analysis and evaluation of alternatives. Um, it's where we're doing that future forecasting. It's where all the community viz and Triangle Regional Model, TransCab modeling takes place, right? Um, so, we're, there's really two parts to that, right? The deficiency analysis and then the alternatives analysis. And so um, we're at that deficiency analysis uh, substage. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide for me, Alex, please. What the deficiency analysis is, um, is it's a measuring of what we typically look at as a worst case scenario, right? What if we didn't really get any more money, but we still got all the long-term growth that we have traditionally forecasted for our region? Um, to do this, we use uh, a socioeconomic forecast out to 2050, and we use a transportation network um, through the year 2025. And so we take the existing transportation network out there today, and then we include uh, some projects that aren't on the ground yet, but would be anticipated to be open to traffic by 2025. Go to the next slide, please. So um, obviously this is an unrealistic scenario, right? It's not something that we think is really gonna happen. Funding will continue past 2025, right? Either that or what's the purpose of having a Department of Transportation and, and a gas tax um, or a wake transit sales tax for that matter. So we know funding will continue, uh, and we know that if, if it didn't, and we didn't have any more money to deal with, with our transportation uh, issues in the region, that our growth and, and the behavior of future growth patterns would shift, right? At some point, folks would, you know, would look at the triangle region and say, wow, that's a really congested place. It's really hard to get around. Suddenly, some businesses might, start, might not start coming here that, that might have otherwise come here if we had a good transportation network. Um, and then population shifts would, would tend to happen either within the region or to areas outside of the region. So we recognize, and you all should recognize, it is truly an unrealistic scenario, but it is useful to help set a baseline to look at our other alternatives. Comparing our future alternatives to just today doesn't really tell us much about, you know, the differences in the future. But so, you, so looking at, you know, today or what we typically call the base year, 
and this deficiency analysis, or sometimes we'll call it the existing plus committed network, out in that future with that future growth, can help us understand where we might be missing some things in, in what we tend to uh, want to include in our alternatives analysis. So it's useful for setting that baseline to look at the other alternatives that are yet to come. And it also is useful in helping to illustrate where um, within our existing or, or near-term funded project improvements, uh, we might be missing other things. We might have some failures in that network. Um, so we can, we can have that information in hand as we move forward and look at our other alternatives in the future. Can you go to the next slide, please? So that future growth for us means um, our growth between what is our current base year, 2016, and our future out year of 2050, um, our population is growing by about a million people, and our employment is growing by about 900,000 jobs. Uh, these numbers will tend to fluctuate a little bit between now and when we finalize them for our MTP adoption um, over the next uh, many months, but um, they they are in the in the in the correct um, ballpark now. Um, they, they, the final numbers may fluctuate a little bit, but but these are, are getting really close to where they're going to end up being. So again, a million new people and 900,000 new jobs. And when we do our deficiency analysis, we, we have run our TransCAD model, or excuse me, our, our community biz model for our future population and employment growth around the region. And then that information is loaded into our, our travel demand model, the Trongo regional model. And we do a forecast. So we do the two forecasts. One is a forecast of 2016, again, our base year. Uh, and um, we typically will use a variety of different um, uh, visualizations of this data. The, um, one of the historically more common ones is what we call the tomato maps. Um, and think of this, you know, how to read this as, a, as sort of like a stoplight, red, yellow, green. If you see green on a corridor, it generally means there isn't a capacity problem. There isn't really a congestion problem. Uh, things are, are flowing as the traffic's flowing as it should. When you get into the yellow and more into the red, you're seeing that volumes are going up relative to the capacity of that corridor, uh, and you might be getting into uh, situations where you have congestion. On these tomato maps, you'll also see that the thickness of the line is indicative of the amount of volume of, of, of traffic and capacity that that, that corridor has. So. Um, when you look at this map, you can see the freeways on there tend to be thicker lines than some of the secondary roads on there, um, if that makes sense. So where you see a really thin red line, it means that, you know, you have a lower volume roadway that is still showing some level of congestion. And where you have a thick green line, you have, you might have much higher volumes, but you also have a much higher capacity on that corridor, okay? Uh, and what we're showing you on these maps here is both the peak and the off-peak periods of time during our base year, so 2016. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see sort of during rush hour, you know, a lot of those places that, that we know all inherently are congested um, outside of the pandemic times are showing up as congested on this map. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you're seeing the midday or off-peak time. Think of that as early afternoon. Um, and, you know, looking at that map, just pointing out a couple of things, maybe around North Hills and around Crabtree Valley, um, you're seeing some congestion there. A few other spots, um, those of you from Southwest uh, Wake, you can see, um, I think that's Avent Ferry Road or, or South Main, excuse me, and uh, in Holly Springs and, and places like uh, the southern portions of NC55 in, in Apex um, as a couple of examples. Um, Falls of the Noose up in the north and US1 up in the north are, are, are creeping up there during the midday. Uh, so go to the next slide, please. So to kind of compare that into our future uh, year, you can see during peak hour, a lot of red on the map. Now you can understand if you hadn't understood before how, why they're called the tomato maps, because it looks like somebody threw a tomato against the, the map that was put up on the wall. Lots and lots of red. But if we, and that's, that's during rush hour. If we look at the midday, you can see that there's not nearly as much red, but there is a lot more red and yellow than there were in the midday for the base year. So we are seeing volumes go up across the board. We're seeing more congestion. Uh, in that future, which would be expected with a lot of our growth. Um, but looking at these two things helps us understand uh, and explain to people that congestion today and in the future 
is not even throughout the day, right? There are times both today and in the future where I-40 is congested and when it, and, and times when it won't be congested. And the same goes is true for many of the other corridors out there at all levels of the transportation network. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Alex. Another thing we look at, and, and those of you who are at the TCC or executive board meeting, you're, you're familiar with these. These are actually the same slides. <laughs> uh, but I did want to just show you what some of the other visual, visualizations that are in the, um, the bundle of information that, that is available via PDF on our website, uh, in the agenda packets from the, from the March meetings, uh, excuse me, February and March meetings, um, and, and that are on our website. So one of the other things we look at is travel time, right? And we use isochrone maps to do that, and and the two sort of points of origin that we that we have that we're showing you right now, this one is showing you downtown Raleigh. I think we also have uh, RDU Airport, and and these are for peak hours, so for rush hour time, right? Um, the the peak travel times, and you can see, um, you know, kind of how far, how long it's taking for folks to get to different places. Um, from those points. So, and on the, on the left-hand side there, you can see some approximate travel time. So to get to RDU from downtown Raleigh, about 40 minutes to downtown Wake Forest, about an hour um, and so on uh, with those examples. The key thing here when you're looking at these maps though, is the wider the color on the travel time, the further you can go for that same amount of time. So each of these travel bands represents about 20 minutes of travel. So that dark green um, travel band that takes up much of the of the um, of inside the Beltline in in Raleigh um, would be from the from say the, the center of, of downtown Raleigh to the edge of that would be about 20 minutes of, tra of travel time, right? Compare that to the next the, the lighter green color the the 20 to 40 minute travel time and and you can get a lot further um, in that 20 to 40 minute travel time band than in that zero to 20 minute travel time band, if that makes sense to you all. So the, so the, the wider the travel band, the likely the, the less congestion and, 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 and better travel times you're seeing within that area, if that makes sense for folks. You can go to the next slide, please, Alex. Uh, again, the same map showing you um, RDU. Uh, and if that's where you were starting your trip from, from RDU um, and giving you some travel times there, uh, in the future, uh, about 30 minutes to downtown Raleigh, 45 to Wake Forest, or uh, 35 to Nightdale or, or Holly Springs. Compare that to kind of what you think about and how long it takes to get to those places today, and you see that it that it that it does go up, you know, in in the future. Again, same the same holds true for the for this map. The the width of the travel bands is indicative of of um, you know how much. Uh, congestion and, and travel time you're you're seeing there. So where where you have a smaller travel band, um, that dark green one, really close into uh, RDU, it's kind of in the center of the map, doesn't go nearly as far as that second green one, the lighter one that goes that that next 20 minutes of travel, 20 to 40 minutes. You can it's a lot wider. You can get a lot further than those first 20 minutes, which means you're you're getting into areas that are probably less congested and have better travel times than than right up close in that first that first um, darker green travel band. Next slide, please, Alex. So um, on the um, screen there and in, and in the um, presentation, you, you'll have a link um, to the online viewer that we're going to show you here in just a moment. Um, you can also get to that through the, the Campo website. Um, and the 2050 MTP development portion of the website. So a couple of things we want you to think about, and we'll, we'll talk some more about these as we step you through the online viewer. Um, thinking about where you're seeing locations of, of changes in travel patterns, particularly compared to today, or where your perception uh, or, or expectation of where there might be certain travel patterns in the future, if you're seeing locations where you're seeing something that's different, from what you might be expecting, that's a good place for you to be looking, saying, okay, what's going on here? Let's dive into that area a little bit more. So, for example, if you saw, you know, a thick red line on a corridor that you might not have expected it, that's probably a good place to go and spend some time thinking about. 
right? Um, also, where you know we also have loaded into this um, viewer the the underlying population and employment growth between 2016 and 20 and 2050. So if you're seeing those locations and they're not what you might have expected, that's a good indication that um, as we move into uh, assumptions about um, other scenarios in our alternatives analysis, we may want to circle back and and look at the uh, community viz data. Um, several communities have already been doing that, um, and some updates have been made. So uh, that that might be something to explain it too. And it may be that there's no change. It's just that what you thought something you know some type of development might happen in the future, that the model is telling us that's not what's going to happen. Models aren't always right. Let's let's remember that too. They're they're forecasts, right? With assumptions built into them. So, um, but it helps us understand what's going on in the model. And if the model is behaving appropriately, then it's a lot of times we can narrow it down into well, what's the policy decisions being made in that area or about that corridor and are those policies or, or, or expectations for what's going to happen in that corridor um, appropriate or accurate or precise, right? Uh, precise enough and, and, and have the conversation about how to do things differently to maybe implement those policy choices that are more desirable for a certain area or less desirable, right? Depending on how it goes. Um, so with that, I think the next slide, Alex, is turning it over to you. Um, I don't think I had another one in there. Yep, perfect. So Alex is gonna kind of walk you through an orientation of the online viewer and talk about some, you know, a suggested approach to diving into the data. Um, and um, we'll take it from there. So go ahead, Alex. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. <clears throat> I apologize. Um, I could send you all a, a link, but I thought it'd be easier if I just start you off with the Campo uh, homepage. So uh, once you're at campo-nc.us, on our main navigation bar, just go over to transportation plan under that 2050 MTP, 20 MTP development. Get all good information, copies of slides that Chris just went over. You can click on deficiency analysis and right there under results and maps is the link to our interactive ArcGIS map. Um, Emily, I see your question about uh, what hours are included in the AM peak and PM peak. I've just texted Gerald to confirm, but I believe that is 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. for the a.m. and I believe it is 4 to 6 uh, for the p.m. but I will confirm back with you as soon as I get confirmation on that. And so, Alex, um, we're not actually seeing your screen. Oh, I oh, think oh, maybe right. you're showing the PowerPoint but yeah. need to share this one. My okay. mistake. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate that. Sorry. So let me start that over. So. I get to the Campo website uh, for those of you that, that want to follow along Campo website and under transportation plan 2050 MTP, uh, the development portion. And then you can go down to the deficiency and needs section. And here's all those slides, those different maps that Chris just showed in the PowerPoint. So you can look at the tomato maps, you can look at the travel time bands, um, but under that first section of results and maps, you can see that interactive ArcGIS map, which will bring you to this lovely application. And one of the nice things I think about, uh, if you can believe it, but working in a pandemic, uh, in the past for the 2045 MTP, we would have you all you know, come in after a TCC meeting and, and we'd lay out a number of large paper maps, uh, which is good, but uh, for the 2050 MTP, being that this is mostly going to be virtual, uh, we're using ArcGIS online and we're giving you access to far more data and information. Uh, and hopefully you'll follow up with us with more questions uh, so we have a more informed uh, MTP. So, when you get here, you probably have a splash screen that comes up and tells you a little bit about the application and the intent, and that's great. I want to point out so many buttons here on my screen. I just want to first direct everybody to the about uh, button on the site. And if you click on that little eye, it's going to pull up a, a nice 
description of all the different layers uh, and the detail. And so, Emily, uh, yes, it is uh, my mistake. The off peak there is 1030 to 330. And you'll see as you come on down to the peak hour. Um, me, let me come back to that um, or I'll get off topic. Um, so the, the about button there uh, will give you a nice description of all the different layers that are in the site. Um, I want to go through a, a quick orientation of those. Uh, Chris had mentioned we have two scenarios that are included in the deficiency analysis. And the first is the base year. So the base year here is shown as 2016. And so here is that tomato map for the peak hour in 2016. And you can zoom in and you can see the values there, but I don't know that the values uh, are as important as just comparing traffic conditions across the region. And just want to note about peak hour. If you if you look at I-40 uh, heading east, you'll see that both lanes show up as bright red. And everybody knows in the AM, it's the westbound that's congested. And in the PM, it's the eastbound that is congested. Um, and sometimes it can be both. But what the tomato maps are showing is the worst condition for each direction throughout the day. So it could be AM for eastbound, it could be PM for westbound on any of these corridors. So just wanna, wanna point that out. So there's your peak condi conditions for base year. Of course you have your, your off peak or midday, lots of green there. We get down to that E plus C scenario. Again, this is the, uh, Emily, hopefully you're getting answers to your questions in the chat. Uh, somebody just let me know if I need to answer one, but um, here's your 2050 scenario scenario with the 2016 roadway improvements and those handful of projects uh, that we included as committed. And again, lots of projects are committed in terms of their funding, but they're so far delayed in the step, uh, we chose not to include those past 2025 uh, in this scenario. So you can explore those different tomato maps. And again, I'm just gonna give you an orientation to the layers and then we'll come back. The next one I wanna show you is this default universe of highway projects. Now this is everything in blue that you're seeing is a potential project for the MTP. So this is the universe of all the different improvements that we know of both in our model and in your local plans. Most of you or many of you have been involved in one-on-one -on -one meetings with Campo staff. We are trying to incorporate as many of those changes as possible into this network and it's constantly being updated. But don't freak out if something you mentioned in one of our meetings isn't incorporated in here yet, we're getting to them. As you click on these projects, you can see the information. So if I just go over to Holly Springs Road, you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, it starts off as one lane in each direction. It's going to two lanes in each direction. And I even have a third project on top of that that go, takes it to six lanes. So there are projects stacked on top of projects. Um, talking about E plus C and some of those committed projects, you see I don't have any blue lines here on 440. That project's currently under construction, will be open before 2025. So it's gray, it's, it's considered part of that E plus C network. And you can click on it, get the information if you want to and see that um, it's, it's six lanes uh, in each, well, not each direction, but six lanes total. So those are your projects, go check those out, see if um, we have the projects that you expected in the network. You'll also want to compare those projects with the forecasted tomato map. So if you're seeing big red in areas, but there is a blue line there, well then hopefully that blue line is meant to address that red congestion that you're seeing in 2050. If you notice right here on this stretch of US-1, and this is between 40 and 64, right? We have no project in the MTP to widen that set, that stretch. But if you look at the peak hour in the, in the 2050 E plus C scenario, you see a lot of red there. So Carrie, I don't know if there's a, an interest there. Um, there won't always be a solution for the congestion. If you look on 440, 
There are no plans to widen 440, and that's fine, but there is definitely congestion there. So uh, you will see congestion in some places, and, and that'll be okay. Let me move on down. You'll have your E plus C transit scenario. <clears throat> so this is the transit network that uh, will be in 2050 if we don't add any extra transit there beyond uh, what's currently funded before 2025. There's the 2016 base transit network that you can explore. I want to go through some of the E plus C, excuse me, some of the SE data. Uh, there's a TAZ layer included for reference, um, but I want you to see the growth. So planners, as you're looking at anticipated growth for your area, check out these different TAZ layers. This is population growth by 2050 based on that E plus C network and the community viz model that kind of goes along with that. So if you're not seeing the growth that you expect, we need to explore that. In addition to population, you can see the employment growth. Now, I'll take you down to sort of my neighborhood, uh, heading towards Fuquay Verena and this Swift Creek watershed, not a lot of employment growth in that area as expected, uh, but you can see there is a good bit of population growth out there. Um, dwelling units is also shown by growth. So you can pull that layer up. Of course, you can click on the different TAZs and you can see how many units of, uh, of, of both residential and employment are assigned to each of those TAZs. Those numbers will change depending on the different scenarios that we evaluate. And as we build more transit, more uh, roadway improvements, the growth will shuffle across the area. But for the deficiency analysis, this gives you a good idea of uh, without significant changes, this is what would be expected. So let me go down. Um, the next couple layers are just uh, sums of those. So here's your, your total employment. This is your 2016. Excuse me, your 2016 base employment along with the growth from the previous layer. You have your total dwelling units, you have total population, total employment. There's also the base conditions. So your employment, your dwelling units, and your population for the 2016 base year at the same time. Now, one important thing. Uh, that we've talked about with respect to community viz, as you go through this application and you're not seeing the growth that you would expect, these bottom four layers um, should help explain that. Um, and these are the place types and the development statuses um, for the community viz model. Now, most time it seems like we focus on place type first and then focus on development side. I tend to think of those in the reverse. To me, I think of development status as first telling me whether or not a parcel can accept new growth. And then the place type will dictate what type of growth, but first and foremost is the parcel going to allow new growth. So I'm just gonna zoom in here quickly and I show you, here's my neighborhood. <laughs> Um, and all these solid colors are development statuses that do not accept new growth. So I'm happy about that because my little parcel in here in this subdivision is black. It is developed. Nobody is assigning new growth to my house. I'm happy about that. Uh, you can see a lot of protected open space here. So at a quick glance, for those in the Fuquay Verena area, you can see these hollow or empty parcels these are the only places in the model where I can accept new growth, okay? So it's one of the first things uh, any of you planners want to look at uh, if the community viz parcel data is coded correctly um, to help explain why you're not seeing the employment or the population growth that you might be expecting. And then after you've looked at the development status, you know, then you can check out the, the place type and that'll tell you whether or not you're going to be getting uh, employment or whether you're getting population. But again, typically uh, when we have folks come back and say, Alex, you're not showing the amount of traffic on this road that we expect. 
Um, why isn't my four lane project, you know, making it into the MTP? And then we look at the TAZ data and, and you tell me, Alex, you don't have near enough growth coming to my area. Nine times out of 10, it goes back to these development statuses and the parcel is coded as, as built out. When in reality, you're expecting more growth there. So I wanted to, to emphasize that. Um, do I have any, let me pause right here because we're about halfway through our time. Are there any questions people are not able to access the site um, or have any uh, questions right there that haven't been addressed in the chat? Hey, Alex, it looks like Luana had a question about why one of the layers there is not is not a project. There's project and there's not a project. Yeah, it's a good question. Shelby, you're, um, you're speaking faster than I can type. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Luana, it's, it's, um, how do I say this? Uh, it's a, a poor label. Uh, so, Tim, if you're on here, make a note. We need to probably uh, do a, change that description. It is, Luana, it is, um, it is either a base uh, network link, it is an E plus C link, or it was considered beyond the realm of the 2050 MTP. Um, so, explaining all that, <laughs> Is a, would make a very long label in the table of contents, but those projects, those those improvements are there, but they are considered complete uh, for the purposes of the deficiency analysis. I, I hope that makes sense. So you can see uh, here, this is 540. Um, it is anticipated to be open by 2025. So it's part of our, our base slash E plus C network. And that's why um, we're not showing it as a, a new blue project. Um, those blue projects, Alex, are, go ahead. I was gonna say, if you click, uh, you stay in that same area if you want, uh, and then, or actually on, on, on Raleigh, that's fine. It, it, turn on your peak period uh, E plus C um, tomato map layer. All right, so you can see there, uh, as he turned that on, on 540, um, there is red, there's congestion in that future during like say rush hour. But as he cycles that back off, underneath it in our universe of highway projects, it, it's, it's that not a project attribute, right? That's telling us there's a future road there, but we don't have any additional projects uh, that might address that congestion <laughs> during the peak hour, right? You can compare Correct. that to say 401, if you cycle that off, again, just north of 540, um, like by the McCullers uh, Crossroads, we have the blue lines out there, which tell us, yes, we're seeing congestion out there in the future, and yes, there are projects there to address it. So when we show the next scenario, say uh, in the alternatives analysis, we would hope that on 401, there's some level of relief to some of that congestion that would show up because we have projects that are now gonna be included in that model run. But on 540 out there, if we don't have any other projects to, to throw into a future scenario, then we would expect that red to stay there unless there was a corresponding parallel corridor that had an improvement that would maybe alleviate, you know, alleviate some of that congestion. So, thanks Chris. So, Luana, if, uh, I apologize, my voice is leaving. I'm losing my voice. Um, one of the interesting or very useful tools is to turn on those project layers, uh, as Chris was talking about, and then add in, you can look at peak, you can look at off peak, but uh, Tim in our office has added the, the swipe tool. And so uh, once you add that swipe tool, kind of lets me go back and forth and I can see, okay, I've got a lot of congestion here on, on US 1 South, uh, and you can see I have no project there. I move farther south past 64. I do have some red, but I do have a six lane widening that hopefully will address um, that extra red that you're seeing there. Um, come over to 540 on the western side of Wake County. I've got red there and you can see I have no projects uh, that, that are going to and, you know, address the additional, con additional congestion we're expecting to see on NC 540. 
And that may be okay, but it's something that we as planners, we all need to look at that um, just to see if there are additional improvements that you all want us to consider in these additional scenarios that we're developing for the MTP. I'm going to try to pull up my chat and see if there are other questions. Um, Tim, I think I just hopefully showed that slide tool, um, the swipe tool. Future transit, uh, I believe that was a question. <clears throat> You can see the additional transit services. Uh, we do not have, uh, you know, all the, the CRT is not in here. The BRT is not in here. Those are beyond 2025. So they, they aren't really included uh, in this analysis. Um, they will be in the alternatives analysis for the MTP. Sorry, Chris. Yes, the Newburn BRT, uh, at least out to to Stony Brook is, is, I believe, the only BRT included in that run. Other questions? Come on, Carrie. Come on, Raleigh. This is Shannon. I have a question. Shannon, Apex <laughs> to the rescue. Thank you. Uh, sure. <laughs> Anytime. Um, so I'm still trying to understand the the place types a little bit. And I think this might be the origin of some questions we've had in the apex. So if something is shown as if something is committed today, to it's committed, it's under construction, or you know, we know it's coming. Typically for 2016, should we be indicating that as undeveloped or redevelopable? It's a it's a great question um, because committed development isn't something that we really address through this uh, this this interface. Um, you know the the place types and the development st status, the community biz model purpose of that is to allocate growth um, to different parcels across the region. When we know that a particular type of growth is coming, we can skip the community biz model and what I would refer to as hard code that growth and say X number of dwelling units or X number of jobs need to go here on this specific parcel. Now, there's some criteria that we have to meet um, to, to, to claim something as committed uh, development. Otherwise, folks you know, around the triangle would just say, you know, I've got a subdivision planned here, but uh, the phrase that John Hodges Koppel used until it's coming out of the ground, uh, we don't consider that committed development. So, yes, if there is uh, a subdivision under construction, if there's uh, an industrial or an employment uh, facility being developed or constructed at the moment, absolutely, we can get up with uh, TJ Coggin and that those dwelling units, that population, or those jobs will be deducted from what we allocate to the rest of the region. So we're not changing the control total. We're still uh, adding X number of, of people and jobs to Wake County, but we're gonna claim a certain percentage of that is gonna land on this specific parcel. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think yeah. Alex, I think that one other thing to add to that is in, in looking around, particularly in, in some of our communities that have been seeing a lot of growth over the last few years, really taking a look at those areas, those parcels that are that are coded um, as committed, right? Um, and, and as we're talking here, I think you've got Apex pulled up. Um, and even further to the west of 540 there, you can see there's actually quite a bit of gray committed um, uh, coding out there. Um, and so one of the other things to check on is if, if we have something listed as committed and, and so a certain number of units were assumed in that committed area, is that number still correct, right? 
Um, so at one point, maybe that number was 200 and now it should be 300, um, or it was 300 and now it should be 200, depending on, on the situation, right? But where, where those, where you have areas that are, that are listed as committed, uh, that means that, that an asserted, a certain amount of asserted uh, growth is going to happen there, no more, no less, right? It's that amount. So that number, being sure we're, you know, that number is, is, is the number we're comfortable with is, is going to be important too. And I think uh, Emily had a question in the chat um, about local transportation plans versus the, the regional um, uh, transportation uh, analysis and some of the differences there that you can see. Um, we, we do, uh, I mean, at the end of this process, our, the regional plan is, it serves the function as both the, the region's MTP and CTP. Um, there is an unfunded element of our plan that would, that is, um, included in there. And those are the, the projects that would be outside of the fiscally constrained, uh, MTP, um, requirements. Um, but in, you know, and a lot of, I know a lot of local. Uh, jurisdictions now refer to their transportation plans as comprehensive transportation plans or CTPs, which can be confusing uh, sometimes. But um, I think the basis of the question here is the, the regional analysis differing from the local analysis. And um, we'd expect there to be differences, you know, when you do your local, when you do a, a, the local jurisdictional transportation plan, you, you know, you might be using different assumptions uh, for growth, for your population and employment for where the growth might be going. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, a local jurisdiction may say there's definitely going to be a certain amount of growth in a certain area. Um, and, and while we just were talking about the committed development status, um, there, there is a, um, you know, we do have some, we set that up to be, you know, some level of, of definition and criteria to that. Um, so the idea is there, is there to get away from sort of um, desired or, or maybe even speculative um, development. Um, we, we've had um, projects in the past that were thought to, you know, they'd be done over, over the next 10 years and we get 10 years down the road and they haven't even really started yet. So that, that's why there is some level of, of, of control or management of, of what we say is committed. Um, in, in what we're, what we're pulling up. Um, a lot of other times where you might see a different volume projected on a future roadway. Um, you know, hopefully the networks that we're seeing are, are pretty close. Um, one of the reasons why we've done these 1 on 1 meetings uh, with everyone uh, and why we do sort of the sub regional meetings in, in, in past times for the MTP development. Is to, you know, look at it and say, do we have. Um, the right set of projects to be considering for the future, right? And, and do we have that the, those future land use uh, plans incorporated? And then the only other thing would be, you know, and, and this was the case for the 2045 and for the 2040 MTPs, we had incorporated the future land use plans of our local communities, but then other assumptions, perhaps more um, aspirational assumptions were desired uh, for the future in some areas. Uh, and so, because of that, you might see some differences in, in what comes out of, of the regional model and what, and what ultimately makes it into the regional plan. Shannon, Emily, hopefully that's answering the questions. Um, yes, thank you so much. I just have a. Quick question. I was wondering if you could log on to community viz at TJ call because I went there and I couldn't find where to find the community viz link, but I did contact Ben. And maybe you can show us just like you showed us on here how to review information there. Um, I cannot do that at the moment, um, but Tim shortly should be listening to me right now. Can you please send Emily the proper link? And get with her on walking her through how to make those edits. And and Emily Ben Bearden is the keeper um, of that site, so he's really the the authority on on how his application works. Um, but I don't believe I'm actually set up as a user on that on that site. 
Kim, I don't know if you are. Did you have? I, I have a I'm here, Alex. Sorry, we've got a couple of us in our, our um, office at the moment. So, Emily, I will type to you directly and get you that information that you need. Thanks. So, how I did it with Ms. Thank you. Oh, it's had another question. This is Luana from Carrie. Is BRT reflected in the E of C transit layer? Only, I don't see it anywhere. Maybe it is yeah. it correctly. Only in the Newburn corridor. And that's because the the timeline, uh, the cutoff that we were using for the E plus C network is roughly 2025 and the BRT lines uh, weren't expected to be operational before 2025. So it's not a matter of is their funding secure? Like I said, we have tons of, of transit and roadway projects that are committed in the sense of funding, um, but at some point we need to sort of cut off what our E plus C layer was going to be. Um, so we, we selected the year 2025 as sort of the cutoff point. Okay, thank you. Now, you will see you before uh, I know Will's on the call before anybody says anything, you will definitely see the BRT and the CRT in the different uh, modeled scenarios for alternatives analysis. Um, and so you'll see BRT and carry, you'll see CRT to, to, to uh, Clayton, to Wake Forest, to Viridia, um, obviously to Durham. Uh, so there will be different scenarios with different levels of transit investment, but you can think of this as sort of the baseline that we measure those other scenarios against. I remembered that was coming later, by the way. <laughs> Good deal. I, I'm glad, Will, that uh, that, I, I, that you remembered that. that that's very good. It, it's um, it, The other thing it does for us, uh, everyone, it, it, for those of you who are here for the 2045 MTP, we we said those BRT corridors they're committed they're in the Wake Transit Plan by 2027, so they're committed, and so we said well let's just use 2027 as our committed window uh, for projects, and uh, and the much more optimistic um, tip and stip that we had back then we had a lot more roadway projects included as well, and so when you compared our E plus C network to any of our other scenarios particularly in transit, but also on the roadway, you didn't see a whole lot of difference there, yeah. right? And, and the point isn't to do an exercise where you see a lot of difference, but, but you know, we had a lot of questions from Will Allen and from others on our board at the time. Well, I don't really understand what, what the differences are here from, from, from what we got. We said, well, that's because everything's front loaded in our plan. This go around things are not front loaded in our plan. You will, you know, see some differences here um, the, in, in our next scenario, what, what's sort of our plans and trends scenario, um, which would be the first of the alternatives analysis scenarios that, you, that you'll see. Um, that's where, as, as Alex said, you're going to see those BRTs and, and at least the one CRT, the initial CRT project show up. In some of the other scenarios, you'll probably see, um, you know, some other uh, passenger rail um, such as in the S line, um, that's been in our plan for, for for several plan updates. You know, going all the way from north of uh, points north of Wake Forest um, to uh, points south of, of of downtown Apex. So, will we be expecting that those types of projects, as well as the roadway improvements um, that aren't in this network, will will you know you'll see some differences in the data sets when they when they come out. So. Uh... We have just a few minutes left. I just want to point out um, as you're reviewing this, if you've got questions about uh, the blue lines, the projects, um, for example, Alex, you have that as six lanes and, and we have it as four lanes. Um, I want you to try to get up with Brandon Watson or Kenneth Withrow, whoever was sort of managing your one on one meeting, uh, and we'll go through those folks. If you're having technical questions about using this application, a button doesn't work, you can't get access, um, I want you to try to get up with Tim Shortley, our GIS expert in-house. Um, if you have questions about the community viz data, the development status, and the place types, 
you know, you're going to work through Ben Bearden and John Hodges Koppel at TJ Cog. And if you forget all of that and you can't figure it out, just give me a call or shoot me an email and I'll try to get you to the right person. And I hope that was helpful. Um, and Bonnie's dropping contact information in there. What does it mean? Sorry. Uh, Uh, no, Emily, it's a good question. Um, so two different things. So the hard-coded growth uh, really needs to be um, under construction or, or on, you know, moving dirt. Um, and I would advise you to talk with John Hodges Koppel about, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I know there are several subdivisions under construction right now, uh, sort of south southwest of Holly Springs, many of those probably would fall into that committed development. Uh, so, yes, so you should be talking to Ben Bearden and John Hodges Koppel about that. TJ Cog kind of manages the community biz side of things. Campo manages the, the networks, the roadway and transit networks. So, um, yes, there are sort of two different thresholds for what committed is. On the, on the network side, we've selected the year 2025 but for committed development, uh, it really falls more as unto under construction at the moment. Hopefully that answered the question. If not, feel free to follow up with me. I see Bonnie's got more contact information going into the chat. I'd like to ask a question. I mean, sure, John, what's up? Uh, this question is probably outside the scope of this meeting. It's kind of a bigger picture question, but you know, when I think about sort of the logic of this process, it is um, egalitarian in the sense that basically as big as the aspirations of a local municipality are, that's how much of this growth that we could project them absorbing. Uh, and so there is a little bit of a built-in incentive for each municipality, if, if their interest is in gaining additional transportation dollars to sort of plan for more growth. Uh, and so that can lead to the uh, acceleration a little bit of, of, of municipalities planning for more and more development. And in some cases, maybe we don't want development in some parts of, of the region. And so has this tool or has Campo thought of other tools for allowing the constituent municipalities to say, maybe we should identify areas in the region where we don't want to direct transportation dollars, and then we want to form our, our comprehensive plans and our land use planning policy to not encourage additional development in those areas with the understanding that we're also not going to be directing transportation dollars to those areas. And that's a political question, and I know that different municipalities will have different thoughts on that, but has that conversation ever come up? Yeah, it has. I think um, an example of that um, in, in, well, it's almost distant past now would be like in the Swift Creek area, right? Decisions on, on doing some things differently land use wise there and, and focusing only on, um, existing corridors rather than new corridors through that area. I think one of the challenges we have in our region for that is that, uh, transportation decisions are made collectively regionally, right? Um, especially the big things, um, but land use decisions um ultimately are made at the local level right and um there are historically plenty of cases of, of all or, or or many many of our jurisdictions um small and large included <laughs> right who you know ha have um at one point or another thought that some areas should be preserved um or, or, or in other areas focused on, and, and those priorities have changed over time, right? One of the reasons why we, we go out and, and, and try to have this input opportunity uh, for everyone, particularly on the land use side, is to, is to help have a tool that can look at these things, right? But ultimately, Campo um, can't force a land use decision on a local government. Now we can, you know, say, no, we're not going to invest in a, in a particular corridor, right? 
or we won't let that corridor go beyond a certain um, number of lanes, as an example, or we want to make transit investment in an area rather than more roadway investment in an area. Um, and, and, and there are lots of examples of those types of things that have happened um, in areas, you know, it, it just looking at Raleigh in, inside of 440, you, you see lots and lots of red, right? And that's not going away across all the different scenarios. Uh, and, and one of the things that we talk about, and I think I said it last at the, at the March TCC meeting is not all red on the tomato map is bad, right? Like in a downtown area, for example, having red, having, you know, there's lots of there's lots of trips and people and things happening in those areas that that should probably be viewed as a good thing. Right. And, you know, generally speaking, we're, you know, you, you're not going to have, we, we aren't seeing here or in other regions, right. Uh, outside of ours, uh, a lot of the transit investment being made in areas where there's lots of green on the roadways um, on their congestion maps. And, you know, we, we actually, I think apex is a really good example of, um, you go back a couple of MTP cycles, like the 2040 MTP, right? So let's say 2010, 11, 12 timeframe. And uh, in particular, outside of 540, the desire was to have a lot of, in the future, a lot of improvements that would result in four lane median divided roadways getting built out there on a lot of two, that were, what are two lane roads now. Over time, there's been a shift to, to not wanting that big of a transportation footprint out there um, particularly in some sensitive areas and going more with two lane and, and, and three lane roads where, where there might be a, a need for a center turn lane um, along some of those corridors. So I think we are seeing that, um, you know, those typically aren't, you know, that, that's where we're working through things like our, our big area studies, like in that case, the Southwest area study to work with apex to figure that out. Um, and, and largely that was um looking at regional travel patterns and then the the you know the town wanting to do something a little bit different than what they've been planning in the past i hope that answers your question hey chris this is will remember those uh models that you did weren't they with tj cock of various scenarios they were scenarios of what land use uh density might look like if it was placed in different places was that the end of 2019 um yeah, you're Remember talking we, about our commuting corridor study. Yes, yes. Yep. Is that, is, so is that, hap- go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm happy to report to you that we are, you know, two of the things that, that kind of came out of that were a recognition of, uh, well, one of the things, two of the scenarios that were recognized as, as being perhaps something our region wants to move closer towards were that ETOD scenario, right, and the mobility hub scenario. And so, and I think you asked the question in January at the executive board meeting, and maybe even in December at the joint uh, board meetings about whether or not we are going to incorporate any of that thinking into our alternatives analysis. And we, and, and the plan is to do that. In fact, um, we've been having some conversations at the, at the technical level about exactly how we do that. Right. And, you know, that'll be coming back to you all with here, here's, Here's how we did it. And here's what we have, and do we need to keep tweaking that a little bit more? It's one of the reasons why our alternatives analysis stage is, is more than just one month, right? It's not just here are the results of these scenarios. We we have time to look at them, think about them, and and maybe make tweaks along the way to to those things. So, just as an example for everybody who may not be familiar with the commuting corridor study, um, you know, one of the uh, the ETOD scenario. Um, looked at two things. One was equitable development around transit areas, but also in, in, in trying to focus more of our region's development in those, in those transit areas, right? So one of the ways we're looking at trying to incorporate some of that thinking into our alternatives analysis for the MTP is saying, okay, we would go into those fixed guideway corridors, like around those transit station areas for BRT or CRT, and um, propose to override the um, the community plans thinking there into something that's maybe more transit oriented or mixed use oriented or denser for that scenario. But that's just one scenario. It doesn't mean that that's the assumption we're gonna use in the final plan. It may get dialed back a little bit. It may get ramped up a little bit. We'll have to see how that goes. But also within the uh, frequent network footprint. So those 15 minute service corridors for transit going and upping density and density allowed in those corridors to something closer to what the community corridor study looked at 
which was, you know, a pretty significant ramp up. And some of the feedback we got was that that's probably very realistic in some areas and maybe not in all of the 15 minute transit service corridors, um, particularly where you have development that's not going to redevelop. Um, so think of some of those 15 minute service lines in the wake transit plan. So out into the future, um, you know, in, uh, going up in beginning to get up into North Raleigh, right? Um, where you've got na established neighborhoods that no one's saying, let's go in and rip out those neighborhoods and redevelop them just for the sake of doing that. In that case, it might be around nodes. You know, maybe it's at some of the shopping centers where you've got big parking lots that have opportunities to do something different. Yeah, I'm, um, I was excited about it when you presented it, and I'm excited that that will have some impact on or help to frame where we go with this analysis and how the MT 2050 MTP develops. At least I hope that's what I hear you saying. That, that is what you're hearing me say, and we'll see what the results are of the analysis and, and, you know, then we'd go from there towards ultimately our preferred scenario, which is usually some sort of hybrid of all the scenarios that get put together. I, I do want to mention that as we get into those alternate scenarios, those different levels of transportation investment for roadway and transit. And as we make adjustments to land use planning based on those investments, that information will be presented to you all. You'll have access to it in a similar fashion. I don't know at this point if we're all we're going to try to cram all those layers into one application. It might be a bit confusing or crowded, or if we'll end up with multiple uh, AGOL sites like this one for each different scenario. But uh, regardless, you will have the opportunity to go in and view all of that information in, in far greater detail than you have in the past uh, with in-person meetings and paper maps. So more to come on that. And we are past our time. Just want to make sure we don't have any other questions hanging out there in the chat. Um, don't see any. If not, so we'll happy to stay on and, and answer more questions. But uh, Bonnie, if you if you want, I think I'll go ahead and end the recording just so it's a manageable length for the YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks very much, everybody. And folks, we'll.